Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next hit of Rugby Nation. I'm Sean Maloney. You can see Beth Newman somewhere on the screen. And joining us for week six, it is a very, very, very happy Billy Meeks all the way from Melbourne. From your kitchen, buddy. Yeah, well, this is the only setup I've got available to me at the moment. Obviously, the missus is still working from home, so all the rooms have been taken up and I've been posted in the kitchen. That's tough, isn't it? Uh, not being able to, to have separate offices and things in this environment. Yeah, I think we've all had to improvise a little bit. Um, usually I'm out of the house for most of the day and then Michelle's obviously at work for most of the day, but now we're both cooped up at home. So there's definitely been some butting of heads, but I've booked in the kitchen for this morning. So it's lovely to see you guys and thanks for having me. You've spent a bit of time in that kitchen. I've got to get to this straight off the top. Your butter chicken photo that you posted on Instagram, the shirt that you're wearing in and around the stove, I'm not on board with, but what's laid out in front is ultra impressive. Talk us through Bill Meeks's world famous butter chicken. Okay, well, thanks for bringing it up because I was going to try and segue it in there somehow, <laughs> but I'm glad you brought that up. But uh, firstly, on the shirt topic, it's actually a vintage t shirt. Oh, sorry. It's worth, it's worth quite a bit of money, mate. Of course so it is. You might want to look into that. <laughs> um, mate, no, so the butter chicken, we've obviously um, been forced to do a fair bit of cooking throughout isolation, um, which is something I enjoy doing anyway. But uh, the butter chicken's become a staple uh, when we have people over or if we're just, we've got a little bit more extra time on our hands. So, um, yeah, we make everything from scratch. We make the, the paste. Um, we make the, the naan bread as well. And obviously the, the saffron rice. So it's, um, yeah, it's become a bit of a fan favourite and uh, we whip it up probably fortnightly now. Do you have anything else in your repertoire or is it butter chicken only? Uh, no, so that's probably the, the most difficult one that we, that we whip up. Uh, the other one would just be making our own pasta. So we've been making our own pasta from scratch. We had a couple of mates over last night and did a, uh, a ricotta and pumpkin ravioli. So that was, that was also a hit last night. Oh, I'm impressed by this. Were you a part of the Rebels Curry Club that uh, Tommy English and the guys had running last year? I'm guessing it's yeah, on yeah. hiatus at the moment. Are you going to bring it back? Um, we're not going to do Curry Club because we feel like that's sort of been and done. We're thinking about exploring some sort of um, pho or ramen or something mm. like that, like a new club. Because mm. um, as you'd be aware, Melbourne's obviously got some unbelievable food options down here so um yeah we're trying to sort of spark something up in the coming weeks i was just going to say that making your own pass is very melbourne isn't it <laughs> it is very melbourne it's almost yeah it's part of part of the culture down here if you're not doing it you're doing something wrong so we've certainly bought into it and um and something else i've, I've noticed you've been doing a little bit of during isolation i'm not sure if it's something you did beforehand but um a lot of meditation and that sort of thing what talk us into how you got into that and, and why you got into that um yeah, so meditation is a, it's a bit of a funny one because I, I think it's something that I've tried to do for a couple of years now, but never really um, been able to get into a, a routine with it. Um, you know, I just found myself sitting down and just my mind wandering and just thinking about a million things and you, you often end up less meditating than you would if you were just walking around. So um, I, I suppose it came off the back of listening to podcasts, reading books, um, and every single one that I'd read from a successful business person or sports person they always talked about meditation at some point throughout their journey and how it helped them. Um, so it got to a point where I was like, well, if everyone's talking about it this much, it's, it's got to be, it's got to be worth giving it an actual proper crack. So I thought I'll set myself a challenge of doing 30 days in a row, some sort of meditation. It might be a couple of minutes, that, you know, maybe it's 20 minutes on a day off. Um, and yeah, so that's what I've been doing. I think I'm on day 43 now. Um, and to be honest, it, I can't probably sit here and say that it's, completely changed everything and I'm this new person but it does give you a sense of satisfaction of achieving something it is nice to sit down and set some intentions for the day um, at the beginning of the day and um, you know a part of it is practicing gratefulness so just you know naming three things that you're grateful for in your life at that point in time um, and yeah as I said it's it's certainly not something that I can say you know this is the number one thing that's making me better but um, it's definitely just adding another string to the bow and um, it's it's nice to just sit down and take some time away for a couple of minutes each day. You know what? It'll be interesting to see how you can use some of those little bits and pieces that you learn along the way pre-game. I reckon that might come into uh, play. July 3, you're set, ready to go. You've got the Brumbies first up at GIO Stadium. How much direction has it given you and the rest of the guys at the Rebels just knowing that you have a date to work towards? Uh, mate, it's been it's been in the back of everyone's mind since we, since we split up before COVID. So... 
Um, mate, it's, it's unbelievable. It gives us a sense of purpose. Um, obviously, we're back in full, full team training now, which, is, which has been amazing. Um, and just, just a sense of normality. Obviously, this, this whole COVID period has been a bit crazy for everyone. And there's been different, different aspects for everyone that's been um, really bad. And some things have been good. It's been nice to get away from the game for a little bit. But right now, given a start date, given a broadcasting deal, and all that kind of thing. It's just like, right, we're back on. It almost feels like everyone's just super, super excited to get going again. And then, as you said, Brumby's at GIO on the on the Saturdays. You know, what better way to start the season? And, and news as well that you guys are probably going to be able to actually play in front of crowds. Is that kind of an extra boost as well? Oh, absolutely. I mean, watching the Kiwi games on the weekend, how amazing was that to see? Um, you know, fans just, just back loving the game, players back playing the game they love and... Everyone just getting around rugby again. It's so good to see it back on the screens. And as players, um, you know, one of the best things about playing the game is experience it with the fans and running out, um, you know, to your home fan, to your home fans at your home stadium. So um, that boost is definitely something the players have been speaking about a fair bit. Uh, let's get into it there then, I reckon, Billy. Let's talk a bit about what we saw from New Zealand across the weekend. Beth, you've got the highlights running in order from uh, Saturday into Sunday. Highlanders v Chiefs. What did you make of that one? Yeah, well, it was a good, a perfect way to start the competition, wasn't it? A, a drop goal by Bryn Gatland, of all people, against his, his old man on the other side uh, to decide the game, a 28-27 win for them. And just... You know, some exciting, fast rugby and, and being able to actually see rugby for a little while was um, exciting. Um, and then on the Sunday, the Blues versus Hurricanes and the, the Blues getting their campaign off to, to a strong start, 30 to 20 win. And, um, you know, seeing Bowdoin Barrett in Blues colours, you know, for the first time, I think was probably an exciting sight for, for everybody. And it'd be interesting to see what they, what they do with him going forward. What was your takeaway from uh, the footy at the weekend? And do you reckon one of the things that bounced out, Billy, was, especially in that game on Saturday, was the strong refereeing at the breakdown. Is that something that you guys are working towards as well? Are we going to be under the same sort of tight restrictions in that space of the game when you get rolling July 3 as they had across the weekend in NZ? Because that second half was hammered in that Highlanders Chiefs game with a lot of penalties, a lot of the time with the team in possession of the ball. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's a, it's a great question because it's something that we've definitely touched on. And as I'm aware, it's actually world rugby um, worldwide. Those laws have been introduced. So um, everyone will be playing under the same laws. And, um, you know, you can only assume all the referees have been briefed on the exact same on the same rules. So uh, Monday, we, we actually touched on all of that. We watched some clips from both games that you were talking about. And I think just touching on those games, you know, whilst there was an influx of penalties around the breakdown, it was, it was probably nice to see the consistency on both sides of the ball. Um, so it's not just something that's being favoured, um, you know, for one team and a certain way that teams play. So it's definitely going to be an adjustment for teams. It definitely suits players that are um, good around the breakdown, get on ball, um, provide the referee with good pitches. Um, and then it probably just puts a little bit more pressure on the attacking supporters. So um, making sure that you're getting over ball as soon as you can, not, lot, not allowing the defenders to have a window of opportunity because it, it certainly looks like the referees are just looking for a picture of hands on ball and a genuine, um, you know, taking the ball away from the attackers. So it's, it's, it's definitely going to be a change for us and um, everyone's going to have to adjust accordingly. And it's kind of, there's a few other rule changes coming into the Aussie comp as well. Have you guys started to really you know, train a few of those things like the 50-22 the kick and those kinds of things that will come in? We certainly have. I mean, there's been some players that, you know, I will name Reese Hodge because we know he likes to talk about his kicking game. He's been sitting under the goalpost with his goal line dropouts, um, you know, trying to show off. But yeah, I, th I think it obviously just adds like a different dynamic to the game. Obviously, when you're defending in certain parts of the field, you might have to maybe consider holding your back three players back a little bit to protect your sidelines. Um, when you're defending in your goal line or attacking in the goal line, you don't want to get held up because then it's just a, you know, you're kicking back and you've lost that sort of field position. So all these different things is just probably just adds a different layer to the game um, and something else to think about. But for the most part, um, probably about just doing the same things and then just adjusting slightly. I just want to see second rowers and back rowers just trying to launch 50-22s. Not carry, just Matty Phillip trying to launch one as far as he can towards the line. He's not bad off the boot, Matty Phillip, actually. <laughs> but I think he's more putting his hand up for the, the goal line dropout return. He's thinking, put me on the 50, <laughs> catch the ball, and I just want a full steam run-up. So we could see some rugby-style hit-ups coming, rugby league-style.
Yeah, let, let's just stay with that for a second. Okay, so someone gets to launch the uh, drop dropout or the drop line goal dropout, send it up the park. Who's the one player you pop it to rugby league style just to charge back into the defence? I mean, Issy Nasserani is probably someone you don't want to get in front of on that yeah. <laughs> that side of things. That yeah. big Fijian thing running at you, I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't like to get in front of him, but I'm sure everyone's got one big guy in their team that they'll be teeing up for that for that job. I reckon Easy would have uh, touches of Petro Sivanasiva charging back for Absolutely. Queensland. Yeah, that that'd be a nice touch. Uh, yeah. Just just on uh, your teammates, Billy, uh, Matty Tamil has been sort of heavily involved in some of the uh, rule changes and that kind of thing. I think he's also been at the forefront with hoops trying to potentially tee some stuff up across the ditch as well. Uh, what other input have you guys had through Matty to Rupert on that front? Uh, look, Matty's been great. It's obviously nice to have someone within the playing group that's so passionate about the business side um, and the future of the game. So um, he's been he's been amazing and in close contact with Rupa um, and representing the players. Um, and he just gives us updates, you know, weekly in, in our players' meetings. Um, you know, it's it's a... It's an ongoing beast, really, the, the future of the game and, you know, what it looks like, um, for, for obviously, for the rest of the year's year, but then, you know, what happens next year. But, um, yeah, I mean, he's been he's been great for us in updating us on everything and um, we're super confident that Matty is having the right conversations and um, saying the right things on our behalf. And I guess you, you seem like another one of those guys who takes a big interest in the bigger picture of the game and that sort of thing. Is it something that you've taken a bit more notice of or, you know, kind of, an active interest in, I guess, given that there hasn't been as much footy to actually play? Yeah, well, I think it's, as you get a little bit older, you obviously get a better understanding for the game and you probably start to consider things that aren't just about yourself um, selfishly and then, um, you know, what's the best for the team? What's the best for the game? Um, what do players actually want? And what, what's the best fit for, a, you know, in terms of culture around a, around a squad? Um, and, you know, what's the best moving forward? So um, those conversations are, stuff, are ones that you start to have as you sort of enter into leadership groups. Um, you know, as I said, get a little bit older and then a little bit more responsibilities put on your shoulders in terms of making decisions around not just your team, but uh, the competition as a whole. You're very quickly becoming one of the more experienced players down there in Melbourne. You've got a youngster that's just joined you in the form of Darrell Skelton and uh, an older hand from the seven side, Louis Holland as well. Tell us a bit about how those two are fitting in out of the Aussie seven setup. Yeah, it's great to have those guys down. Um, obviously disappointing for how things are going on the sevens front, but for those guys to be able to join a super rugby franchise so quickly, um, you know, what an amazing opportunity for those guys. And then, you know, I, I played sevens, it would have been eight eight years ago or something like that. Mm. But Louis was there when I was playing, and he's mm. still he's still there now. Um, so I've known Louis for ten or ten or so years, and he's just such a great um, ambassador for the game. He's he's got a good head on his shoulders. Um, he's great around the playing group, so he brings a, a huge amount of experience um, on that front. And he's just a, he's just a good just a good country bloke, you know. He's he's we took him out for dinner on the first night. Gerard actually came as well. We took the new guys out, went for a beer, and. Louis just telling some of the great stories. Tommy English, they're just, you know, shooting some of the good old times. So, um, Gerald's been really impressive. He's a pretty big frame for a young kid. Um, and I know he's been touching a few of the older boys up at training. So, um, you know, we've, we've started doing contact now, which is something that he he enjoys. And I know he said to me, it's a, it's a little bit different. He's trying to use his footwork at the line, but there's all these bodies in front of him. So, he's going to obviously have to adapt um, to learn how to sort of... Um, benefit his game in, in a 15 sense but you know to have those guys down here is just just great for the team as a whole. Do you feel like they will be able to kind of slot in pretty quickly or will there be a bit of a, an adjustment period I guess? Uh, look I think it'll I don't think it'll happen straight away um, I think they're probably blessed given that we've they've been here for a couple of weeks and we've still got another couple of weeks to go um, it's probably just the contact and and that side of things consistently that they'll have to get used to and adjust to but uh, I think it's fair to say that we're getting a fair amount of contact in at the moment at training. So I think they'll be raring to go come round one. Geez, he, th he can throw a long ball, Louis Holland. I think you'd struggle to find a super rugby player who can ping one as far as he can. They go a mile. And they bullet as well. He threw yeah. one yesterday at training because we haven't done too much of that stuff. But he threw one yesterday at training. And it was Matty Phillip actually turned around and he said, oh, my word. Yeah. How did you do that? Because he doesn't float him. No. He just bullets him. Yeah. Left to right on the chest. So... Yeah, there's, there's a weapon.
And he can also switch up the carry as well. So if he's running, he can switch it to the other side and, and toss it that way as well. So he'll be handy alongside you, buddy, as you swing back into it. Uh, let's talk about some of the sides that you're going to be up against. We had Harry Wilson on last week from the Queensland Reds. We floated the Western Force with him. You're a great guy to go to on this front because you spent a bit of time over in the West. What are you expecting out of the Force when they front up in week two? Uh so, firstly, I think it's amazing that they've, you know, they're back in the competition. I, you know, to have all five teams back and playing in this competition, super exciting for us as players. Um, and we can't wait to go up against them, to be honest. Um, I think it's going to be certainly between us and the fours. So there'll, there'll be a fair amount of passion and it'll be fairly fiery. Um, but all in good spirits. Um, you know, there's some guys there that obviously were probably disappointed that they aren't playing super rugby the last couple of years. Um, and now they've been given an opportunity to to play in what is a super rugby competition. Um, so like, what an amazing opportunity for those guys. And mm. I think we've seen the last couple of weeks, they're starting to get a fair few players back involved that have been there in the past. You know, John O'Lance, Kyle Godwin, Kane Kateka, just to name a few. Like these are really good quality players, which is only going to boost um, their squad. And I think they're going to be extremely competitive. And, um, you know, this whole competition as a whole is going to provide some pretty good viewing in terms of rugby and, the players are so excited for, for what it's going to be. It's interesting you mentioned that, I think, because, you know, there's probably a lot of chat around, like, on the East Coast, and everyone's kind of moved on in some senses, you know, in terms of the new look Super Rugby and that sort of thing. But do you, do you really feel like there is still that sense, uh, you know, from a WA perspective, that they do have a really big point to prove and that the things that happened, I guess, in 2017 are still, I guess, kind of raw and, and you know, they still feel them a lot? Yeah, I don't know if it's fueled by what happened in 2017 as much anymore. I think it's more so that, you know, as we all know in WA, there's such an amazing rugby community and culture there. And they've got such an amazing um, homegrown talent there that they're probably just, you know, um, they really want that that pinnacle of rugby, which is super rugby in Australia, as a pathway to get to, um, which unfortunately they haven't had for the last couple of years. So that's probably the desire that they have and where the, the passion and the heart comes from. So... As I said, to have that opportunity again for what is a super rugby quality competition is just so good for the game over there. And I know from experience, the fans are just so passionate. They actually just genuinely love rugby over there. So, um, yeah, they're going to be super excited for the competition. I've just remembered you two. That remember there was all the dramas between <laughs> Melbourne and the Force when Davey came across to the East Coast as coach and a bunch of players came as well. I just remember there's some pretty bad blood between those clubs. Yeah, I mean, it was all pretty messy, wasn't it? it was, um, yeah, I mean, it seems like a lifetime ago now. It but does. Yeah, for, for whatever reason, you know, what <laughs> happened happened and it, it wasn't ideal. But I think, you know, for, for a big chunk of us, it was an amazing opportunity to come to Melbourne, stay with Dave, stay with our same coaching group. And there was, you know, 12 of us that came over as players and we got an opportunity to play together and then build on what the Rebels have here. So, um, you know, at the, at the time, it, it was actually... You know, pretty pretty tough decision and tough situation to be in, but you know, for whatever reason, it's ended up pretty good. And have you watched the Force last couple of years and seen how they've? I mean, they obviously won the NRC. Um, you know, do you do you reckon that they can be a really competitive force in in this competition? Oh, without a doubt. And I, I think I think the way they play as well, which is quite expansive, um, given the rules that they were playing under in rapid rugby, they've developed a style of play that's going to be extremely competitive if mm. they can if they can execute it. Um, it's super hard to defend when you're going side to side, end to end, throwing the ball around. And that's stuff that teams have to prepare for defensively because it's a lot of ball and play time. Um, they're backing their skills. You're going to have to make sure that your defensive structures are on point. Um, and if they can play the way they want to, and especially with these guys coming in, there's no, there's no reason why they can't go, um, go really well in this competition. Uh, now, over to you, mate, on the personal front, as we close in on full time. I believe you might be off contract at the end of this season. Please tell me that we're not going to lose you back to the Northern Hemisphere. Are we going to be able to hang on to you for the next little bit and beyond here in Australia? Um, yeah, look, I hope so. It's obviously it's obviously that time of year and in every year there's there's going to be turnover of players. And I think given the current state of the game in terms of clarity around what next year looks like. Um, it's only natural that players are going to be looking um, and, you know, weighing up their options. Um, so every, every, I'm sort of treading water at the moment, to be honest, mate. Like, I, I want to stay here. I love playing in Australia. Um, 
And, you know, in an ideal, ideal world, I will stay here. Um, but given the fact that there's a freeze on contracts at the moment in Australia um, for next year, it's probably just a case of treading water and um, just trying to play as well as I can in the, ne in the next few weeks and hopefully get a little bit more clarity around that uh, in the next month or so and then try and make a decision. But, um, you know, for me now, it's probably just about putting pause on that whole side of things and just putting my head down and working as hard as I can because, um, you know, another thing about this competition is it's, it's a genuine... Um, trial match to put your hand up for test level because we're just playing against your, your direct competition every week. So there's that side of things that's super exciting and um, I'm just looking at the next month as a, as a real big opportunity to get better and um, put my best foot forward in terms of selection. Do you think that mentality is kind of reflected more widely as well? Like, you know, as you said, the 2021, we still don't know what that looks like, but, you know, having something in place for now at least gives you a chance to focus on, you know, that, those Wallabies battles and things rather than worrying about maybe what you're going to be doing next year. Definitely. And that's that's what's so great about what's happened in the last couple of weeks in terms of announcing the competition, announcing the broadcasting deal. And it gives you a sense of actually things are actually all right here and we're getting it sorted, um, which has allowed a sort of optimism amongst the players around what happens next year because we are getting some clarity and it's starting to happen quite quickly. So, you know, I'm extremely optimistic about what next year looks like. It's just about getting it set in stone so then we can start making some actual decisions. But, um, you know, as I said, it's it's great to have the, the back end of this year sort of because there's no doubt all of us want to be here. We all want to be playing rugby and the sooner the better for us. So, um, yeah, as soon as we can start playing, then it's, it's better for everyone. And luckily, that's not too far from now. I don't know if you would have had your date set. Well, certainly, you would have had the date set because you would have wanted to be there. But this weekend, Billy, would have been the Super Rugby final had it not been for the damn coronas, the damn COVID-19s. Mm -hmm. So, rugby.com.au are going to roll out the 2014 final on Friday night just as a way to try and take us back to the good old days. What classic match would you like Beth and Fanman to dig out for you for next week that they can then watch in full? Is it possible to get a hold of Hodjo's final game at the Western Pool? Yeah. Can we get our hands on that one where he kicked the goal at the end? Yeah. Only because I was obviously playing and I wouldn't mind seeing my mug on screen. So can we dig up that one? Yeah, that's, mate, that's a great yeah, we shout. We definitely got that one, yeah. Okay. That's that's awesome. that'll definitely be there somewhere. Jeezy hit that shot at goal so <laughs> ugly at the death as well. Oh, didn't he? I remember it was pouring with rain that whole day. It was so, so grim. Yeah. Uh, yes. Well, to just get get some connection. Oh, grizzled Hojo saying goodbye off the back of a decent Bill Meeks performance. Mate, thank you so much for uh, chiming in with us. What I am going to do is I'm going to share with you a little pasta recipe that I reckon you should have a crack at. Fettuccine con salsiccia e fungi. I've been... Ping that one through to you. You can have a crack of that in the uh, Casa de Meeks. Thank you, mate. I appreciate that. Very generous. <laughs> uh, Billy Meeks, thank you so much for joining us on Rugby Nation. And we'll be back, won't we, Beth? Same time, same place next week. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me.